measuring distances. So this is the, really the challenging part where uh, parallax measurement is great. It's direct, you're not making any assumptions, but it's uh, limited. It can only measure things that are relatively close. This parallax effect gets smaller and smaller for far away objects. So one of the first methods that were applicable to larger distances were standard candle that used these uh, variable stars. And want to uh, point out, so when Henrietta Leavitt discovered this, yeah, it was in 1908. So there's many nuclear physics to speak of. This is like beginning of quantum mechanics. Um, so this is almost a chance discovery. This is something that a careful observer would notice. So I want to put ourselves in that view. So I'm gonna uh, launch Space Engine here. And let me just uh, um, put ourselves in the uh, position of someone who's observing the stars in the night sky, um, except this simulates more than just that uh, planetarium observation. Um, so, so imagine we are here, imagine you are in the orbit and you are observing the night sky. I'm gonna, um, I'm going to um, turn off some things like the orbits so that it doesn't distract us. Can I turn that off? Uh, let me just leave that be. So this is the night sky. I guess, uh, let me just turn on the constellations to help guide the uh, directions a little bit. So there's Cassiopeia and, uh, oh, that's Andromeda galaxy, by the way. It's, uh, um, it's, I think it's uh, as bright as a relatively dim star. It should be visible um, to naked eye. Where am I looking? Oh, Cassiopeia. Okay, so that's a North Star. And there's a Ursa Major. Yeah, so that's a, the, um, <laughs> that, that's the Big Dipper. Okay, so I think what I'm looking for is um, in the Southern Hemisphere. So let me just look around to away from the northern hemisphere to southern hemisphere. Um, yeah, that's the Milky Way galaxy and somewhere in the southern hemisphere here. It might be easier to see without the constellation marks. Um, ah, there it is. <laughs> The Magellanic Clouds. So that's a uh, large Magellanic Cloud, and that's the small Magellanic Cloud. And um, we understand these now as uh, dwarf galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. And um, and so back in uh, that early 20th century, I think we we were still developing our idea of uh, the structure of the Milky Way galaxy. We didn't fully understand all the deep space objects. But one thing that was known was that these stars were um, quite some distance away and clustered together in such a way that they were at more or less the same distance. And that's the fact that was utilized to first establish the, the relationship that uh, there is a relationship between luminosity and the period of the variable star. And um, so, and it's, uh, I mean, it's amazing what kind of detective work sometimes goes into um, the discoveries because you have to imagine this from uh, the point of view in the history where we don't know anything about stellar dynamics. We don't know why variable stars are variable. But someone was able to figure out, hey, we have a collection of stars at some large distance away. And the one thing that's consistent about all of them is that they are at about the same large distance away. So even though we don't know that distance yet, we can use the fact that we have this collection of stars at a known same distance we can use, um, and using that we can uh, figure something out, uh, figure out something that we didn't know before. And the reason I'm doing this in this software is to kind of give you an idea of how this looks like. Um, 
um, kind of relative position between the Milky Way galaxy and these uh, Magellani clouds so that I can talk about the distance between them. And I, th I think that's uh, easiest to do in the universe uh, map because in this view, it's a uh, kind of, no, oh, actually, can I, let me see if I can do this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I can do it, but I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so let me go into universe. Because, you know, I rotated myself out of our galaxy and it's all very confusing. Okay, let me go into universe map. This is a lot easier to see. I'm gonna center myself uh, back at our sun so that we have some starting place so that's more familiar. So that's our sun, that's our solar system, that's uh, all the nice solar system objects that I've been talking about before. Let me zoom out quite a bit here. Once you zoom out quite a bit, the system will draw, system draws this uh, plane for me. And what this plane represents, it's the galactic plane. It's the plane in which, um, well, our Milky Way galaxy is. So depending on what I it is, what it is I want to see, I can I there's a benefit in either looking at um, either edge on view or looking at the top down view. So if I want to look at what our galaxy would look like from someone who has the best vantage point as possible, then this top down view is might be what I would want to see. In the top down view, I can see, okay, let me go into exploration mode. I can see what the galaxy looks like. That's our uh, spiral arm galaxy. Somewhere there is the center. Let me, so, so that's our galaxy. And, um, and uh, the edge on view. So this view, by the way, again, this is, a, is perspective of someone who has the best vantage point possible. It's not, um, it's not the vantage point that we have because we would have to go 130,000 light years out of the plane of the galaxy. We don't have technology to do that yet. Um, our own vantage point is more similar to this, which is the viewpoint of our galaxy with edge on. This is the, um, necessarily the viewpoint that someone who is inside the galaxy would have. So, so that's the viewpoint we have. Let me um, center back at the sun. Where's our sun? Um, find the home. Okay, let me center back there. And I'm gonna zoom back out because it's gonna zoom in. Uh, I don't know this software well enough. I haven't figured out a way to stop that. Okay, so this is where we are. Um, let me turn on the, okay, let me zoom out more, more, more. Okay, so this is where we are in the galaxy. So let me just rotate this view around a little bit to see where the large Magellanic cloud or small Magellanic cloud is. Um, I'm just gonna rotate this around a little bit. Uh, I'm looking for any collection of cloud looking thing that uh, I might recognize it as that those dwarf galaxies uh, that are nearby. Maybe I haven't zoomed out enough. Um, let me zoom out further. Ah, yeah, okay. So <laughs> those are the Magellanic clouds, large Magellanic cloud and small Magellanic cloud. Back then we didn't fully know um, the full details that we know now that, you know, there are dwarf galaxies containing approximately this many stars with this much mass. But even then, back then what, people knew was that these, um, did I? these uh, cloud looking things that they represented a collection of stars, collection of stars quite far away for small Magellanic cloud. So, okay, I guess we, they didn't know this number, 200,000 light years, but they knew that they were all quite far away. So for all the stars within this group, however they were related to each other, as it seen from Earth, they are more or less at the same distance. So you could use the differences in the apparent brightness to directly infer the direct differences in luminosity. So let me end this with here. So I think uh, I will, let's uh, try going to the 
small Magellanic cloud. Um, let me do it this way. I'm gonna go home first because I rotated myself out of the um, out of the galactic plane. I, for a kind of more realistic travel, I need to first to be home and then um, and then I'll go back to the universe browser and then uh, travel to the galaxy. Okay, so I'm back home. Uh, let me just. Uh, Go to universe map, zoom out, 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 out. Okay, I think I might need to rotate back a little bit. Okay, um, I think, yeah, that is the small Magellanic cloud. Okay, I think I was told if I close the universe browser, that'll still be selected. Good, let me center that. So that's small Magellanic cloud, and let me just press go. So yeah, I outside of Milky Way. Also, that's why the star field is gone. Now um, I was playing with this before, and I think when I arrive here, it's going to be a little bit disappointing. Yeah, it has to do with uh, the fact that so I mean you know the, the shape of the Magellanic cloud is here uh, that hasn't changed, but the disappointing thing is. Oh, wow, is it modeled as a, I wonder if a small Magellanic cloud actually has a disk-like shape. It's an irregular dwarf galaxy, so it could have some depth to it. I guess that's the choice that's made in programming this. <laughs> I don't know if it's physically correct. Um, and I guess from here, we can look at the Milky Way galaxy. So if you are somewhere in the neighborhood of the small Magellanic cloud, that's what we imagine the view of the Milky Way will be. Now, as far as the view of the small Magellanic cloud goes, um, I kind of have to stop here because um, I have the filter set up to only show me real stars and um, this is not being on um, really, you know, the catalog that this, uh, the program is made from has limited collection. I don't think they list individual stars within the small Magellanic cloud individually. <laughs> so I have no stars to select here, maybe other than that. I think um, so. We are at the distance of about 6,000 light years from the galaxy. So I think that star is. Um, I think that star is within the yeah small Magellanic cloud. So that star is in the catalog, but I don't think any other star is. <laughs> so uh, if we want to look at anything uh, less, uh, less uh, disappointing than this, we do have to turn on the procedural stars. But I will have to tell you that these stars are not real. They were they are generated by the program. So, um, so yeah, I think I'm kind of gonna end the things here because, you know, so this is the place where we, um, we are at the limit of what has been cataloged, what has been measured. So I don't have any real stars, um, real stars here that I can travel to and uh, explore, I, they are, Stars I can select, but they will be um, they'll be procedurally generated as stars uh, within the small Magellanic cloud. And this is uh, sometimes we talk about artists' conception, and this would be an artist's conception of a star within the small Magellanic cloud. There are uh, so for one, it doesn't exist. And when and if we do find a, a blue main sequence star that's a part of a binary in a dwarf galaxy and somehow we are able to travel there and observe it, I think uh, I can tell you uh, before we know much more that this software will likely, uh, I have to, this software will likely have missed some details of this, so. Uh, so I think I'm going to have to leave it here at this uh, simulated, procedurally generated star that, um, oh, I guess I can do this. I can 
imagine what it would look like to look at our sun from here. So from the position of this star within a dwarf galaxy near us, our sun would look like this. Let me see if I can even zoom in. Under a very powerful telescope, we might be able to resolve the sun or not. Because our sun is not a very bright star. Okay, okay. At the highest uh, allowed a zoom within this program, I see the sun is a very faint uh, star there. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, apparent magnitude is 23. I don't know if that's the apparent magnitude. Uh, but one thing that you will see if you are somewhere within the small Magellanic cloud, one thing that you would see prominently is the Milky Way. Milky Way is actually a pretty large galaxy. It has a number of, um, number of satellite dwarf galaxies. And from the vantage point of any of those dwarf galaxies, Milky Way should look pretty large. So um, yeah, so I, I guess I will leave that there. Uh, I, so I might look at the Stellarium, which is a real, you know, let me do that. Um, so I'm gonna quit here so that uh, uh, my computer isn't trying to run two demanding software at the same time. So um, Stellarium is, it's not a simu, I mean, it does simulate some things, but everything in Stellarium is um, based in real thing. And, and it's a trying to, uh, and it has a more comprehensive catalog than Space Engine does. So let's uh, uh, let's see what the small Magellanic cloud would look like under a powerful telescope. So because we are in the Alameda is in Northern Hemisphere, I do have to turn off the ground to be able to see it. And since I'm messing with the physical parameters, let me turn off atmosphere as well. That way I don't have to worry about if it's night or not. So, so that's the view of the small Magellanic cloud that you would have from a portion of Earth where those are visible, some are um, further down south than where we are. And um, this is what it would appear like. And if you zoom in further, I think you can, yeah, I'm trying to look at the distance. Um, do they have distance marked? Um, possibly not. So I don't know how many of these individual dots are cataloged. Um, and yeah, and that's where my expertise runs out. And that star cluster, what distance is it at? Yeah, so, uh, so we have this uh, view of the <laughs> small Magellanic cloud. And I think uh, if you want to know any details about any individual dots here, uh, you need to talk to a professional astronomer whose job is uh, measuring properties of those. <laughs> but, um, but this is something that you can see under a relatively powerful telescope. And I guess the difficult to work here is separating out some of the probably nearby stars from the stars that are in that galaxy, so, or dwarf galaxy.